Thanks for, everyone so much for joining. Uh, I am Bobby, I'm co-founder and CEO here at Elyon. Um, we're excited today to do a deep dive in the AI scribe space um, with uh, three awesome clinician leaders, all of whom will have expensive experience uh, evaluating and using these technologies. You know, as I'm sure everyone on the call knows, AI scribes are having a moment right now. So, um, you know, this is a particularly timely conversation. We're gonna be saving the last 15 minutes or so for audience Q&A. So, um, be sure to be thinking about any questions you'd like uh, to you know, have our panelists answer. Um, otherwise, I'll bring in our panelists and have them quickly introduce themselves. Kendall, why don't, why don't we start with you and uh, just have you give a quick uh, introduction. Hey, everybody. I'm Kendall Cannon. I'm an internal medicine physician by training. Uh, initially started out at Intermountain Healthcare and then went to Stanford to try to figure out how to do healthcare better. And I've been in the startup space since. I have implemented and will evaluate it and then implement it AI scribing at two different startups. Um, so have gotten to see back uh, in 2022 when it was first starting and, and then what it is today as two very different things. Great, Zaya, do you wanna go? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Zaya Diasin. I'm an emergency physician uh, and uh, I well, work with generative AI uh, in, in healthcare uh, through an advisory firm uh, called Automatic Health. Great. And Matt? Hello, uh, Matt Sakamoto, a virtualist primary care doc based out of San Francisco. Um, also did training in clinical informatics uh, at UCSF. So bounced around to a couple of different places, but um, also for me, it's a lot about thinking about the documentation burden for the doctors in my, my medical group and across our system and how do we make that less painful and get them home to hang out with their families and not type on their computer at night. Awesome. Uh, well, great. Well, why don't we kick things off, Zayed, with you. Um, uh, before we dive into the specifics around AI scribes, I think it's helpful to set the stage uh, just in terms of where AI scribes fall on the spectrum of care automation and risk. Uh, and I know you've put together a thoughtful framework for this in one of your Substack posts. So I was just hoping you could share, you know, what you think are some of the key factors that define different types of AI solutions and then where you put AI scribes within your framework. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, over the course of the past year, the entire, like, every industry, healthcare included, has been trying to understand what AI is going to do for it, particularly generative AI. Um, but it's often been really confusing to understand when someone says AI for healthcare, are they talking about a system that generates automated billing codes or this completely autonomous holographic doctor? When someone says like, AI for medicine, they could easily be talking about either of them. Um, so we've put together a framework of, of five levels that talks about, you know, as you give more and more autonomy to the to the machines, um, you need to have a higher and higher level of safety and security and verification that this actually works. Um, and we base it on the system that was put together by the American Society of Automotive Engineers for self-driving cars to go through. They're going through the same journey of taking something that used to be 100% manual. And now we're moving to like letting cars actually drive. It's something where there's human lives and billions of dollars at stake. And as you put more and more automation into the process, you need a high different characteristics for the operator and then different standards uh, for verifying the technology. So the way I think about it in healthcare, level one is the introductory level. Level zero is nothing, it's a doctor in the back black in the black bag. Level one to start off with, you're not trying to affect the clinical process. You're not applying to affect the patient or the decision. It's all administrative and back end. At level two, you're talking about process automation and making things easier and better for either the clinician or for the physician, but not really trying to change the decision or the outcome. At level three, you're really getting into clinical decision making. How can it, AI help clinicians make better decisions? but it's all very explainable. There's still a, a human in the loop, the doctor still very much in control and everything that is being advised, there's a train back to original sources that you can say, this is why the computer is saying this. Um, and at this level, you're not regulated by the FDA as software as a medical device. This is something where you can build up a non-device clinical decision support system and roll it out tomorrow. Once you take away some of the explainability um, and are giving more directive advice, the FDA considers that software as a medical device. And if you're going to do that and take on that 
risk and roll, there's a set of criteria that exist for what you have to do um, to use that in clinical practice in the United States. Um, and right now, there are a lot of softwares as a medical device, but none in the language space. They're all pretty much radiology and cardiology, but this is coming. And then the level five, it doesn't exist today, but it's when we actually start giving autonomy to the machines. It's when there'll be a time when you have an algorithm where, that will actually be able to order a medication, do a prescription, order a test that right now is a purview of a licensed medical provider that will happen without a human in the loop. We don't even really have the legal or the regulatory systems to do that, to even to consider what that would mean today. And when that happens, it's going to be very incremental steps through more and more levels of risk and autonomy there. Um, but that to me is, I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure if it's five or 15 years in the future, even the first steps of it, but this is gonna be a slow process. Back to what we're talking about today with the AI scribes, they are to me a level two solution. You all that you what you need from them is to know that they're accurate and that they're helpful and that you're not like generating garbage information. But it's not a clinical decision support tool today. It's not really trying to change anything about clinical decision making. So, um, to me, the the safety profile for these is pretty good when you're evaluating a solution, you want to make sure that it, it feels right for your use case and in your environment to check it yourself. But that's that's kind of becoming, I think, table stakes at this, at this point um, for really any of the companies that you wind up considering and, and vendors. It is worth noting that almost no one markets themselves as a digital scribe. They all market themselves as physician co-pilots. So I think there's an aspiration pretty universally that they're going to move from level two up towards level three and starting to do more and more. Um, it's really not clear at what phase, at what pace that aspiration is going to play out um, and if, if it does for everybody. Got it, super helpful. Um, also plug for Zayed, he's got a great Substack post on this. So uh, folks should definitely go check that out uh, and subscribe, we'll, we'll include the link in what we, what we send around. Um, but super helpful background. Let's let's now get into uh, actually the details. So we'll start with vendor evaluation. Um, and Kendall, I'll come to you. You know, you've implemented AI Scribe solutions at a couple of different organizations now. Can you just talk a little bit about what the primary driver was for you to look into the space, and then walk us through how you went about evaluating some of the options? Uh, what was the driver? Doesn't it just seem like magic? I just thought it sounded cool, so I wanted to do it. Um, you know, the, I think we all know how much of healthcare is administrative and the burden that that has on the team. And, and actually one of the things that pushed me over the edge was I had a couple of clinicians who were getting a little bit older, who could not keep up with their notes. Um, and, and they were looking at saying, Hey, I'm maybe I have to get out of the game. And I thought there has to be a better way than this. We have to figure out something that can help them stay practicing and stay doing this because they were exceptional clinicians. They just weren't as good at the documentation in terms of trying to type while talking. Um, the first time I did this, it was in a home-based care model. And so they were trying to type, type, talk on a laptop in a patient's home, like totally terrible um, uh, user experience in terms of from the clinician perspective and trying to get all that documentation in. And so that's really what pushed me over the edge to look at these as a, I'd heard about them, they seemed cool, um, and uh, to, to really start to evaluate them. Got it. And as you start started to dig in, um, you know, can you just talk a little bit about how you actually went about evaluating them? Um. I remember first looking at, I think I heard about uh, DAX at a, at a conference and, you know, they gave a pitch and I thought this sounds magical. The more I tried to dig into it, I couldn't find anybody who could show me the solution. Um, and then I started to look, this is back in, in early 2022 at um, a bridge because I loved the idea of starting as a patient facing service, right? Cause their, their whole pitch initially was, why don't we have the patients bring this in? and let the patients be able to have a transcript of the 
of the conversation and then they kind of pivoted to help clinicians with their documentation. Um, I ended up being introduced to the folks at Ambience by a mutual friend. And I will be very honest, having looked at most of the other solutions previously, I was kind of a jerk. I was like, God, not another little kid trying to figure out how to change physician workflows. Um, and so I was not the nicest. And uh, they had convinced me to, to try it with this clinician who was about to quit. Um, and it was so game changing for her that that's what really pushed me down the path of okay, what would it take to implement this across an entire practice? And at that time in a home-based care model with spotty Wi-Fi and all of the complications that that, that brings. Mm -hmm. Got it. Matt, I want to come to you. Um, I know you've you know tested directly or seen demos of most of the major folks in the space. Can you just talk a little bit at a high level about where you're seeing differentiation between different yeah. solutions? Short answer is, I think at this point, not a ton. Um, like I said, they all do a pretty good job, some more than others. Um, uh, the framework I kind of use is ACT, so accuracy, cost, transparency. So cost is actually kind of probably one of the, the, the most objective differentiators between them. Um, accuracy, how correct is the note? How much tinkering do I have to go back and, and do it? And then transparency is like, if they're saying they're pulling these things in, why is this in the HPI section? Why is this in one of these sections? Um, so that's kind of the, the main pieces, but and I'd say they're like of varying degrees of accuracy. One hasn't like blown the other one out of the water by like a huge margin, at least from what I've seen, um, both in demos and or trial uh, trial runs for some of these. Um, and then the last one, I'll, I'll probably circle back to this on implementation as well, but it's the level of um, integration, right? So um, does it work? Does it drop directly into your EHR? Do you have to copy paste it in? Um, Cause I mean, as we know, any bit of friction makes a difference. Um, so yeah, those are probably the, the biggest ones, but yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to hear from um, everyone else on this call, but I haven't seen like huge differentiators in accuracy. Gotcha. I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to Kendall or Zed here. If, if you guys have seen, you know, as you've tested solutions, you know, not specific solutions necessarily, but just kind of where you've seen any meaningful differentiation uh, at, at a high level. I'll share that the two biggest things that I've noticed, one is, not very scientific, but I call it the make me look smart uh, a factor, which is how well is that note written in terms of things as little as grammar and structure. It, clinicians want to, to look intelligent. And so can you write a good high quality note or is it more like a lot of the stuff that I saw, it was more like a, a trying to transcribe from Siri or on a, a, a Google document and it just wasn't great in terms of the, the document quality. Um, the other piece was integration, like Matt had said. It can be the best solution in the entire world, but if you have to do four extra clicks, nobody uses it. And so it it just, it, it has to be able to seamlessly enter the EMR um, because you, it has to be easier than writing a note. And not all of the solutions were. Got it. Dad, I want to come to you. I know you've you've also written a post on evaluating AI scribe solutions. So, you know, if you were to name kind of the one or two biggest recommendations that you have uh, for how to evaluate solutions, what would what would they be? This is going to sound like a complete punt, but it's really to know what you're trying to do. Um, are you trying to keep your older physicians from burning out? Or are you trying to keep your whole staff? from burning out? Are you trying to juice productivity? Are you trying to get make sure that your coding integrity is really high um, because you're doing, um, because you're trying to do like meat coding for uh, like for, for value-based care? Like know what you're really looking for because what no one solution is gonna be right for everybody. And so you, you need to really understand your, your 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 use case. And so I think like the the question list that you put together, Bobby for Ilian, is really fantastic as a place to start. Once someone's gone, once you've gone through that, highlight like the two or three rows that are like absolute critical, the first things for your for your group, and then I'll go things what what doesn't really matter before going into your evaluation. Makes I think sense. one of the things I wanted to add to that too is. 
I noticed that different stakeholders had different needs. And so almost running that, that awesome um, kind of use case, but with the various stakeholders, my CFO, my clinician, me, my ops team, we all had a little bit of a different perspective. And so how do you find the two or three spots where you're most overlapped in terms of what is the win? I would also have... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. You know, I would also really think about what kind of clinicians you want to have using this because the needs are different. And it actually kind of goes back to some of the integration needs. If you're doing like long mental health visits, that's one kind of a thing. Um, and it will want a certain kind of ver verbosity. Um, for people who are doing a lot of hospital based specialty work, what I haven't seen anyone do particularly well is pull information out of the EHR to, to feed in. And so if you're for inpatient notes, for emergency department notes, a lot of what's the, the thinking that's going on there or the background would ideally be pulled from the EHR because that's what we're all doing. We're reading the EHR before we go in and see that patient. May not be relevant for primary care or for urgent care, but knowing that this is a 65-year-old woman with COPD and uh, an FEV 165% of expected who had three ED visits in the last year and their EHF is 45%, like that's all the core stuff. And it starts to get into the summarization that the co-pilots are all supposedly coming out with. But if you're, if, if hospital work is a big part uh, of hospital and like very in complex medical stuff is a big part of what you're doing, just the conversation only isn't going to cut it because that's not what we're, that's not what we're writing our notes based on. We're writing on what's already there. To piggyback a little bit off of what uh, Zayed was saying, when I'm looking and evaluating kind of which clinician would benefit from what tool, I've almost like likened it to like uh prescribing medication that's like, oh, if you have this indication, I think you might actually benefit from just voice dictation. Like you just type slow, but like everything else is pretty fast. Or chart review kind of takes a long time for you. I can see that you spend like over half your day doing that. Let me teach you like filters and ways to do this. So it's, it's um, yeah, I, I like your point again, it's not going to be one solution for everybody. It's how do you tailor the right solution for yeah, individual um, inefficiencies. Got it. From a from a practical perspective, do you have any advice on on best practices in terms of actually putting these systems through their paces? I mean, obviously you're gonna go through example calls. And I'm sure you're gonna do a good amount of complexity with those, you know, run the full end end workflow, but do you see any particular tactics or things you would advise? Again, you guys all having looked at these, what you would advise others to do in terms of truly making sure you evaluate these solutions well? I mean, having seen a bunch of them, I do give bonus points to people that have a trial. Like it's it's one thing to watch a demo. It's one thing to do a live demo. But like, if you are brave enough to say like, hey, try this out in the wild. Because, um, you know, th things things are different in a uh, conference room than they are in an exam room. Um, so at least for me, that, that gets bonus points is to allow for actual trials, um, short term or not. That was always what I said is if they can't give me a real time demo, then they're not ready to go to clinic. And so finding somebody who'll do that for you. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say get, get, a, get a couple of, get a one month demo for four or five different users and have them try a couple of things out. Try, I don't know, Nabla and Ambiance. And they do a week of each or two weeks of each and, and be able to compare with a couple of trusted clinicians in your org and just see what it's like in in, in the wild. And I will say Makes just for, for my standpoint, I've actually done like head to heads. I've, I've like, I'll run it off two phones and have like a fake encounter with a colleague and just kind of run it and see like, how do they look different? So yeah, I've really, and and you need time to do that, right? You're not doing it in a conference room. So I think, uh, again, to your point, having a couple of licenses and getting to really kick the tires is super important. Got it. Makes sense. Cool. Well, I want to move on to implementation now. And again, can I all come back to you uh, since you've, you've implemented an uh, AI Scribe solution now at a couple of places. Any, um, I guess, first, maybe just walk through kind of what the process looked like to actually roll it out. And then any either best practices or, or maybe maybe more mistakes or learnings from the process that would be helpful to share. The first time I rolled it out, the organization had only up to that point done telehealth visits. And so I was needing to transition from a solution that had only done video 
to a, a home-based care model. So not even like a clinic controlled area. And so um, Pine Park Health does home-based care for residents of senior living, which have very intermittent and spotty and variable Wi-Fi, um, even depending on which room you're in. And so one of the things that I found was trying to make sure that all of the, the pieces were in place, whether it was the Wi-Fi, the technology, um, that ended up being a significant barrier to implementation that you wouldn't necessarily have if you're in an office, but you do have if you're in a hospital. I don't know how many times I go into an ER and my cell phone won't work, right? Because the, the there's no uh, signal down there. So just making sure you know what you have. The other thing that was really interesting when I implemented this was um, around setting expectations, both for the clinicians and from the financial side. Um, my organizations have been value-based care. And so the correct ICD-10 or, or diagnosis is very important, as is the appropriate meet or kind of CMS validated uh, documentation to go with it. And so um, initially when doing this, I had such low expectations that the team thought it was like amazing. Uh, and, and it felt very like, wow, I thought somebody was sitting behind me and typing this while I was doing it. And they really couldn't believe, um, probably because I'd set the expectations so low. The second time I implemented it at another organization, I thought it was pretty cool and it worked and I just watched it work in home-based care and I was implementing it in a clinic-based setting. Um, and for the first couple users, I set the expectation too high. Um, and so being very clear with people that this isn't going to replace all of your note-taking or everything that you do. Uh, I used to tell people, and I still do it, it'll write about 85% of your note. If you're expecting it to be perfect, then you will be disappointed. Um, it's like when we tell patients, uh, this pain pill will get rid of all of your pain and it doesn't and they're so sad, or if it'll improve your pain by 50%, then it's a miracle drug. And so just setting the expectations with them as to what to expect. The other part that was really powerful that I didn't anticipate in the implementation was I didn't realize how much time my clinicians spent between writing an assessment and plan, how much time I spend writing my assessment and plan, which is in doctor language. And then we try to write these patient-centered care summaries or after visit summaries, but that's the actually the most important part to get the patients to do whatever it is that we just spent time talking about. Um, and being very clear and working with the vendor, this is doctor language, this is patient language. And I think that was one of the most powerful tools that I didn't expect was it basically just translated it for me into patient-centered language. So I didn't have to write two notes. I had not realized that I was always writing two notes in, in these kind of home-based person-centered care models that I've been creating. Got it. Super interesting. <clears throat> Matt, I want to come to you um, and focus a little bit more on kind of the hospital and health system perspective here. Any any recommendations in terms of, you know, best practices there in terms of what you've seen well or not work well when it comes to training and adoption? Yeah. I mean, so unlike Kendall, I actually, I'm, I'm still in the looking phase, right? So I'm, I'm trying to figure out like what's the best solution again for, uh, the different uh, clinician populations. So I've yet to actually do it. That being said, I really use the um, kind of EHR implementation framework in my mind. I've gone through a couple of epic co-lives from paper to epic. So kind of seeing what that looks like. I think the lift isn't going to be quite as big, but there is that same level of depth for sure. Um, expectation setting, um, ha having that at the elbow support. It's one of those things where doctors in particular are like cranky people. Uh, so having somebody there to like walk them through say these are the different things a tip sheet is not going to cut it so just kind of be ready to be hands-on doctors are needy uh is the short answer uh, so having that at, at the able to support that training piece and then that maintenance piece i think we focus a lot on like day one and maybe like first 30 days but how do you take people to that next level again i'm using an ehr framework but i think the same thing stands here um 
good. You can go from voice to note. How can you make that note better? How can you teach them kind of these tips and tricks that optimization piece at, you know, day 45, day 90. So be ready to have some of those materials ready. Cause I think you'll have like your early adopters really like it. And then how do you push them further and, you know, and get more out of the product? Last one is just around metrics. Um, so I, I think the main one is like, how short is your note time? Um, or time spent in notes. That's one that everyone's going to look at. But, and I think Kendall mentioned it, it's what are the other pieces that you're going to follow? Is it um, number of patients seen per day? How much time is not spent in the evenings? Other things too, though, time to close notes. Like if that was a problem before, like that actually is dollars because you can't really bill for it until the note's done in fee-for-service settings. So kind of think creatively about what these halo effects are because there are a lot of things that um, when we implemented virtual human scribes that I kind of wasn't expecting that um, both kind of positive metrics and negative metrics that, that that had. So sort of set up a wide halo of metrics as well, because I think um, having that balanced scorecard is also important to watch mm -hmm. as implementation to maintenance phase happens. That's helpful. I'm is there sure anything? That I, oh, I did implement human scribes prior to implementing AI scribing because uh, it was something that the clinicians really wanted. And it was interesting the turnover rate, getting them in, trying to get them trained, it took a lot of time and it was expensive and it was pretty hit or miss in terms of the documentation quality. Um, and so when I brought in the AI scribing, I thought it was also going to be difficult having done two EMR uh, launches and and transitions. You know what I mean? Like we've seen these, these different technologies come in and, and they always make life harder. And what was very unique about this to me is that, um, you know, the first time around I went really slowly because I did, rolled it out with one clinician at a time, helped to refine the product. I was there partnering with them. The, the vendor was there partnering. We were kind of trying to figure it out. Um, the second time, I, it, none of the scribes were showing up. And so we just ended up launching it to all seven clinicians the same day. Uh, in, in this one clinic. And it was amazing to me that it, they loved it so much that they were the ones who just asked questions via a Slack channel with the vendor. And by Friday, we were using it for a hundred percent of the notes. And I have never seen anything where it's implemented that quickly with people who love it. Um, and so that was very unique from any other implementation I've ever seen. Got it. Super interesting. Oh, so um, one, one other workflow thing that I'll throw out there, and, and this is just personal reflection. So I'm in general, like a talk and type kind of guy. So I'm talking with the patient, whether I'm in the room with them or doing a telehealth visit, I can talk and type and multitask. Um, a lot of doctors don't. But what I realize is that I type and I'm kind of offloading my memory onto the page. So there's stuff that I look back um, when I'm in just a one-on-one -on -one talk and type situation. When I switched over to both human virtual scribe and ambient scribing, that's not there. And I realize that memory crutch is a different workflow for me. So if you have docs that are used to like kind of a talk and type situation, you can prep them for that. And you can always write on paper, right? There's, there's, there's things that existed before EHRs and, uh, and AI scribes, but it was a subtle workflow thing that actually surprised me. I didn't realize how reliant I was visually on words that I used to type on, on the screen. Super interesting. Um, I want to keep moving um, and get a little bit into the usage and practice. So, so Kendall, I'm going to come back to you again. Um, would just love to hear kind of what's the end to end workflow look like, you know, from so in terms you, know, of, you pull it up. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of how to, to the scribe worked for us, um, every vendor is different. This is just the one that I had gone in depth with. Um, it's in, we used a web-based EMR. And so at the time we were using Alation. Um, and so you click the link as you're reviewing the chart and you just kind of talk out loud the stuff that I normally write on a piece of paper, uh, or that I start to type in the note, the kind of the pre-charting, um, and, and what is that so that I can walk in, I think to Matt's point, current state is more of a scribing transcription. Future state of this is very much a different patient clinician experience because we use the chart so much to cue us. What are the diagnoses? What are the past labs? What is the, like, how do we serve up that information differently? But for today, the end to end was click on it while I'm pre uh, kind of looking at the chart before I walk in, walk into the room. I can pause it or not pause it during the transition. 
uh, hit play, have a conversation about whatever the most important things are for that visit or whatever it is the patient wants to talk about. Um, walk out of the room into the hallway, hit end recording within 30 to 60 seconds. It pulls up the note. Um, the kind of Auto code helps to recommend the ICD 10s, which was really important for me um, because there's diabetes, there's hundreds of ICD 10s, but only some risk adjust. And so recommending the most likely uh, diagnosis based on the conversation was also pretty interesting to see the accuracy there. Uh, I click these are the four diagnoses, it writes the note, I push it into elation, it automatically pulls it into the bill. And that also generates the patient summary. And so the MA can then come back around and either give them a printed version or tell them it'll be in the in the app. Got it. And is it, when you're pushing it back in the EHR, is it literally pushing it into different sections of the note? And is it pushing the codes into the appropriate places as well? Correct. Um, and that was, it was interesting to use it in a different scenario where you had to copy and paste and the, the barrier was higher. Um, so I've used it when I was at Stanford. Um, it, it's a higher barrier when you have to copy and paste than when it was fully integrated and just pushed right in uh, to the note. Got it. And have you um, heard any pushback from patients thus far in terms of, of having the visits recorded? Um, I'd be curious yeah. to, to hear anything about that. It was interesting. The clinicians initially pushed back. They said, what are we going to do about recording? Do we have to ask for permission? my answer to them was, do we ask for permission to write in an EHR? Like we're writing down all this, we're documenting this stuff. Like, let's think a little bit outside the box here. Um, and that was before going in and talking to the patients, the patients generally think it's cool. And so I have never had a patient who said no um, to me or, or to any of my clinicians. They're generally like, Ooh, can, can we see, show us how it works. Um, so that was surprising as well. The clinicians, there was more pushback from the clinicians than from patients. Got it. Um, cool. So I want to come back to you um, and and hear if you have any learning specifically on what to look for with respect to EHR um, integrations and in both directions, right? In terms of what you're able to pull out of the EHR and into the AI scribe, as well as um, particularly around it, what information uh, uh, you push into it. I guess it's really about, again, we talked about earlier the ability to summarize and extract uh, and then when you're pushing how much structure can it do some places will just give you a note and it's all cut and paste or even if there's an integration it's just cutting pasting everything into the note versus something that's actually able to put put the code into the structured code field and put the past medical history into the past medical history fields how much how much structure um can it can it put in yeah, makes sense. Um, Ken, I don't know if there's anything else you'd add to that based or, or Matt, based on your experiences um, testing it out or using it, anything else that might not be obvious to, to call out from an integration perspective? I was actually going to ask both Kendall or Zayed. I mean, like, I guess it's nice. It's really nice if it can do that. Relative importance for both of you on a abil like ability to do that, do that now, like, where I'm actually curious, like where where you put again, like like putting the family history in the family history field rather than just like having it, you know, written out on in the note itself. Also, for me, it's kind of low, but I'm I'm kind of kind of curious to hear from both of your use cases. Are you talking about structure versus yeah. unstructured? Structured data, yeah, yeah. So having the words on the page, not just be words on the page, not not just not just the right part of the note, but actually go into the right part of the EHR. Um. Again, my expectations started out pretty low. Uh please make it easier to write this note so it isn't as painful. Um, it was interesting as we went along, the degree of structure. So when I first started this versus today, the amount of data that is now structured is pretty surprising and that it can prompt or, or put it in the right spots within the elation chart, not just for today's note, but for all of the chart prep. Um, but again, I, that, that took some time and working with them on, here's where I want this stuff to go. Um, but it, it makes it easier for everywhere going forward. Got it. I think it depends on, again, what your kind of use case is. I don't think it's necessarily a, a must have for everyone, 
Um, but if you're doing a lot of like new patient intakes, and that's a big part of what you do, like it will like there's still going to be wind up being a, a ton of effort for the clinicians to go in and put that stru structured data. Someone's going to have to structure it eventually. Um, so I think it depends on the situation, but there are times when it matters. Matt, I want to come back to you again and talk a little bit about ROI. Um, you know, obviously these these solutions aren't necessarily inexpensive. Um, so I'm curious, how how do you think about ROI specifically for for this type of a solution? I have refused to tie any um, efficiency gains to being able to see one more patient. If the doc wants to do it, great, like go for it. But like I have refuse to use that in my calculations. I think there's like way too much pressure to do generate more RVUs and other things. So I've tried to not have an RVU ROI. Like that's just sort of like my base principles. Other people definitely want it. Uh, but at least when I'm looking at them, that's not a top tier thing. But a lot of it is, it's like, what is like that work-life balance and just like getting home, getting out on time. So that's kind of retention to Kendall's point uh, for your docs before. I'm almost thinking of it as a recruitment. Uh, again, I, I use... Um, EHR is a sort of my analogy for these before it actually used to be a thing where you're like <laughs> if you're on an EHR docs that would rather have written on paper like that was like actually viewed as a negative um, are there ways to actually have hey you have access to scribing or access to in basket support other things like that or you know, inbox support as actually ways to get people to, to join you know your primary care clinic or join your practice or these these certain things so I think um yeah, as as those functions start to develop as well, kind of saying like, hey, we can almost guarantee, you know, less time spent at home and things like that. So I think uh, from a recruitment standpoint, um, we're not there yet. We're definitely not there yet, but I can easily see that within the next one or two years starting to become a practice differentiator for uh, medical groups and medical practices. Mm -hmm. does, does your CFO buy that? I think I'm always struggling between. I, 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 I love what Matt's saying. Like, like what, what you're saying is like absolutely the right answer. And like, there are ways you can construct an ROI based on, you know, your quality of coding and your level of ICD capture and the, and getting more level five and higher level of visits and plus or minus productivity. Like there's a way to construct it with all of those concretely. To me, none of those are as important as what you have said, but how do you have that conversation with a hospital CFO in, in a way that doesn't feel too fuzzy? Like yeah. we'll say, okay, now you have less doctor turnover and that's miserable and expensive. But, you, you but most of them that. don't even measure the turnover because it's a multi-year process and they're looking quarter to quarter at the finances. So let's like be honest about what we're measuring it against. Um, I, I have the same thing. I actually get, there was an article that I wrote or that I had an interview that I gave and they pulled out of it. Oh, you can see more patients because of this. And I was like, dear God, that is not the point. Um, that is not what we're trying to achieve. That is not the goal of this. And when you need to sell it to a CFO, it, it's a pretty easy financial calculation to see even one additional patient a week. Um, pays for the service. And so that was where I found the win-win between what I was trying to achieve, which was a clinician and patient experience and the business argument for the cost of the, of the technology. And so uh, I will just be honest, nobody cared about any of my <laughs> soft fuzzy things that I care about. So I also had to come up with a financial solution. The Did you actually oh, go, go, go ahead, Zed. I was just, I was just gonna say, did you actually, did you track it? Did you, did you prove it out over time that like, yes, we're actually seeing the difference here since we rolled this out? Yeah. So there's a case study uh, done based on both of the orgs that I rolled it out with. We did a pre and a post of clinician experience, pre and a post of the number of visits, the charting time after. Um, and so those case studies kind of showed that this worked to the financial piece. To Kendall's point, it's the break even point. The goal isn't to make the most money possible, or my goal is not to make the most money possible. It's a CFO's goal. So that's where you kind of meet in the middle, right? It's like, hey, I, we'll break even by doing this. And it's really not that hard to do that with a lot of these just um, because of all the inefficiencies already built in. Um, but yeah, so driving maximum profits is, again, not my role. Um, 
it might be theirs it's on, on the counterbalance but yeah so you have to have it none of this is free but i think it's um having break even or you know slightly over break even be the goal not um maximizing number of patients you can see per day or things like that I want to do one quick lightning round question um, for the group before we open it up to Q&A. Um, I'm just curious, you know, each of you, I think, have talked a little bit about, okay, they've got kind of the core functionality they have today, but they're all they're all starting to extend into additional areas of the workflow. Um, I'm curious what, you know, what capability or capabilities are you most excited about these, these solutions adding next? The two that I have been most excited about, so I'm going to throw it in, one is the pre-charting, as Zaid had mentioned, being able to, to take the information from the chart and serve up to me the information that I most need. That to me is going to be the holy grail of really changing the experience because I won't have to go through all of those pages. There'll be a ton of difficulties around what information is served. Is it better or worse than a human trying to review the chart? And I think there'll be a lot of pushback there. But if that can be done and be better than what I'm currently doing today, which is sometimes walking into a room with no, no background because I didn't have time, um, that I think will be the most powerful. Um, and then again, it's it's around that integration of if I say I'm ordering a lab or I say I'm ordering a medication, having it fully teed up for me because um, I can't tell you the number of times I say I'm going to do something in the conversation and then I forget to put the order in right away, it causes a poor patient experience and it causes inefficiencies. They have to call back and say, oh, Dr. Cannon forgot to order this med. Um, and so those are the two on um, kind of the front end and the back end. Yeah, I think from my end, there's the chart biopsy piece that that's um, that's definitely there. Teeing up orders. I think actually that, that that's my like number one thing. I think it's just, it's so hard to navigate, particularly particular EHRs, Epic. Um, there's just so many things. It's, it's the user interface isn't, isn't great for putting in those orders. So can can we kind of have a more streamlined experience where I just look and say like, yeah, that's the order I want. It tees it up. All I have to do is hit sign, not do the data entry piece. Um, and then from an equity standpoint, and I haven't seen a lot of people nail this well, but I have a lot of colleagues that are um, bilingual clinicians, right? So if you speak Spanish, if you speak Vietnamese, um, most of the um, companies will say like, oh, we're like not quite set up for native uh, back and forth between those two. It probably can. I mean, the LLMs are pretty good, but like no one markets it that way cautiously. Um, so I think being able to say like, yeah, like go for it for different um, native language speaking between both the clinician and, and the patient is a uh, pretty high from an equity standpoint um, on things I would like to see on people's roadmaps. You know, I think Ken and Matthew cover the most important things. Um, the other thing that I would add is, is not even really a, a true extra feature, but it's just, uh, it's just, it's, it's more about stability is offline recording and transcription for hospital and ER settings. Like your Wi-Fi is unstable and it's never going to be good. And, and so it's really frustrating to like, you put your phone on you start recording the conversation, you go into the room and then you come back out and like your Wi-Fi is unstable and like you it hasn't done anything. Um, and that happens a lot. So I think a better support for like offline transcription, whether it's through local recording on the app or however they, they want to do it, is is important for is especially for like hospital and home based clinicians. Got it. Cool. Um, super helpful. So I want to I want to turn to the audience Q and A. So I'm just pulling this up on on my end. We'll jump around a little bit. Um, so the first question um, is the future of AI scribing specialty specific or will generic cross specialty solutions win out? I think it's a really good question. Um, any 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 hot takes from our uh, from our panelists? I, I think that most you know all the big vendors are trying to develop profiles for every major for all the specialties and adding more and more and more. I don't. I don't think that you'll see a company that, oh, this is the orthopedic provider and this is the primary care provider. Um, they'll all have profiles that, you know, at, at one point in time, one may be stronger than another in particular specialties and styles, but that difference, like this is, I think some of the dirty secret is that a lot of the LLM stuff that was that was rocket science and impossible in science fiction two years ago, it's, it's now become the technology is going so fast that's become easy. So I, I don't think that 
that's going to be a, a big differentiating factor, say two years down the line. I think it's almost going to be, it's less per specialty and like, what is the customizability per clinician? And again, you have to balance customization and standardization um, and, and what you're going to serve up. But I think that's going to be like, uh, to Kendall's point, right? Do you want your notes long, long form prose or bulleted starting to kind of put in some of those things? And then again, obviously per specialty kind of, how do you want those set up? But that, um, cause I can't imagine a single company maintaining 50 different per specialty, you know, base models and language models. So it might even just be tuned at the clinician level for a lot of these things in the same way that people can kind of make their own custom chat GPTs, you know, at the moment. Mm -hmm. Actually, I want to follow up on, on that point because I think it's a really interesting one. I'm curious what you guys have seen in terms of the ability to fine tune these different solutions and, and kind of at what level has that happened? Has it been the organization level? Has it been the department level? Is that even at the individual clinician level? And also a second part of that, what dimensions, like structure of the notes, depth of the notes, you know, certain types of language. Uh, I would just be curious to hear what you guys have seen. In the two implementations I've done, it's been interesting because um, for better or worse, I've wanted to standardize across my practice fairly significantly. And so things like uh, HPI length, in some ways I kind of wanted like a, a little make it longer, make it shorter uh, slide ruler so that each clinician could pick. But as kind of the person deciding, I got to say, here's somewhere in the middle, and this is how we want the length of the HPI to be, the length of the documentation. Um, and so that was from a customer, like how to customize it. I, I ended up picking that based on the feedback of the clinicians and myself, but I wanted it very standardized. Um, I have not yet personally seen it having the ability to be um, standardized to the initial individual clinician because some do like bullets and some like long form paragraphs. Um, but I wanted more of a standardized process and so didn't didn't ask or want for that. I think there is at least one vendor that I've seen, and I'm, I'm not intentionally not saying them. I can't remember which one because I get a lot of them. One of them does have that, like, do you want it longer or shorter at the individual license level? Um, but with my more uh, physician administrator hat on, Kendall, I, I, I tend to lean towards standardization when I can, just because that helps with the maintenance and training and all the other downstream things. But um, one of them, I, I know at least one of them does offer that level of tuning, at least length of note or, or you know, bullets versus pros. And I know I, I've looking at some of the questions, a lot of people are asking for us to be specific about one vendor or another, and you're all hearing us like working really hard to avoid it. And we're doing that for two reasons. It's not just to frustrate you, but I, I'm going to speak for myself. I don't know if, if Ken and Matthew feel the same way, but I can hear you doing the same thing that I feel like I'm doing is that one, um, we know people are in process and relationships and don't want to be advantaging or disadvantaging people based on like specific knowledge that we've received to our rules which is not for public distribution the other is changing really fast and the capacities and the features are changing so quickly that because it happened to have that feature when we looked at it two weeks or a month or two weeks ago and you're going out to do an evaluation in six weeks uh, you shouldn't be looking at what the artifact of this interaction that we had at some point in the past you've got to look at it at the time when you're looking because the vendors are changing so quickly i do look at vendor team that's actually one of at least on my scorecard like what is their ability to kind of work with us um you can always say what your roadmap is versus like what i think they can execute on their roadmap uh so for what it's worth yeah <laughs> and again yeah thanks Ed, for pointing that out yeah I'm thank being... you for, from my perspective too i <laughs> i know that i'm biased because i've implemented the same solution twice like the same vendor twice and they've worked with me and they've made it better into what I want. And so I'm trying not to, to, and most, and some of the stuff that I looked at was a year ago. And, and I remember somebody saying in there like, Suki didn't do this or that. I was like, yeah, back when I looked at it, Robin was terrible, but the idea was good. And so how to just help people evaluate how it is today, because it is changing quickly. I think the one thing that I would say specifically is like go with a vendor that's not that like that proceed whose existence preceded chat GPT. Um, this takes some, even though the technology is moving fast, it does take some thinking and thoughtfulness. 
And someone just spun up like a whisper on a chat GPT wrapper. That's not going to give you the level of service and clinical support and really just deep thoughtfulness that you want for a clinician oriented product. Um, and, uh, you know, th there is, I think a big difference. I, I see that three big categories of product. There's like the new startups, I think post post chat GPT new starts, which I, I don't take very seriously. There's like the big player. There's like what I consider the legit established startups, ambiance, Nabla, a bridge, Suki, et cetera. And then there's Microsoft DAX, which is this whole other thing. Helpful. And Dad, I appreciate you saying that. What they are too nice to say as well is that I asked them not to <laughs> say too much about specific vendors too. So, so yeah, we want to we want to give general principle for folks to help them through their through their evaluation processes. Um, well, I'm going to jump to another question in the Q and A. Um, the question is: In value based care, is the ROI truly just around efficiency gain and increase in the patient visit volume? What about ROI around accurate and specific clinical documentation? Um, Kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll direct this to you since you've you've done this in a couple of different value-based care contexts. Um, the again, the importance of diagnostic capture, also sometimes known as RAF, is is critical in value-based care. Um, it is no one's like goal as a clinician to maximize revenue by getting a specific diagnosis, and so this is one of the ways that I found it actually led to much better diagnostic capture through this system. Um, it did not start that way. That was part of what we worked with them to build. Um, and so now it's it's very effective. Um, the other part I thought was really interesting from a uh, making sure that each of the diagnoses had the appropriate documentation, how diagnose what's been done and what we're doing today. Um, is not always easy to like it takes a lot of time to write out each of those things um and so how to to work through that process even if i didn't say each of the pieces and how you pulled some of the data from um, other notes uh, i think is still a little bit of a work in progress um I have a workflow related question here for again anyone who's 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 done both. Uh, but do you do you use AI scribes differently for telehealth visits versus in person? Um, and, I do them exactly yeah, the same. Use... Yeah, no difference. I'm trying to think of anything that would be. I mean, I guess the physical exam is a little bit different, but I, I've gotten kind of used to verbalizing my physical exam both in in person visits and like oh, I see that you don't have a rash or I see that your rash is kind of small on your left arm. So I've kind of gotten used to just most because I have been using scribes for a bit, but yeah, I don't really do it much differently. But I, I think that actually does bring up an interesting po point about like how the scribe actually changes your practice style. I think like Matthew brought up something before about how the memory crush was different. I actually found that I talk to patients about the assessment and plan more and differently with the AI scribe, because it's now, if I do that, then it's that I'm already started to chart it versus going back and like putting all my thinking into the, like just directly into the, the, the voice dictation on the computer. So uh, I, I find that it has like made me in some cases talk more with the patient about the assessment and plan because that's part of my documentation. To me, that was the biggest win of this because I I truly do believe from a patient experience, they want to hear some of this. Um, we're not really in a world where the doctor is always right. Doctor says X, like, uh, which I didn't realize there's still places in the world where they want to just be told what to do. Um, but here we, patients generally love hearing the thought process and it gives them more confidence in the answer because they can go and Google various parts of it. Um, and that ended up being one of the wins for me is that not all my clinicians did that. Uh, it wasn't how we were trained. Uh, and so it brought that into their workflows. Even on the HPI, like taking the initial thing, like I realized I actually do like looping with the patient a little bit better. So that's like, oh, just so I understand, I'm doing this fully for the benefit of my scribe. And I'm like, just so I understand, like you had these uh, certain things. And so I, I'm actually asking back and clarifying more often, again, more for the benefit of the scribe, but the patient feels more heard because I'm looping and doing kind of just these um, empathy and communication techniques. Um, 
So I found that even that, 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 that's been helpful. Cool. Um, we'll have just a couple minutes left. I want to ask one more lightning uh, round question before we, we wrap up. Um, outside of the AI scribe space, what is what is the generative AI solution or area that each of you is most excited about um, uh, moving forward? Inbox management, communication. Can like, how do we communicate with patients and 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 make that a delightful experience instead of the painful one it is for clinicians and patients right now? And can you just say real quick, what would great look like for you there? Like, what? How does? How would that be? Uh, that will take more than two real. minutes. Um, but <laughs> okay. the very short version is a multi-modal communication. So text, uh, app, um, phone call, all of it integrated, being able to route to a central location, and then some of the answers being automated versus uh, only prompting a clinician when a clinical need is made. Um, that would be my beautiful portion. Going off of that, I think some specific things that I'd want to see off of uh, inbox management would be summarization. So there's a lot of text change, at least for me, I have a largely messaging based practice. Um, so that we'll go back and forth for over the course of a, a few um, hours and or days. Is there a way to like put that together into like a single thing? It's like, hey, here's like the upshot of their cough or their runny nose. Um, and then triaging. So it's like, to, to Campbell's point, I'm, I'm actually kind of, I don't know, maybe more comfortable than most of starting to have some of this low level triage um, and take human out of the loop, um, be there. So maybe for like, for like the logistical stuff. So scheduling. If Google can do it, then the AI solution <laughs> can do it. Yeah. Um, so starting to take a lot of these things, not even uh, to like my MA's level, but like fully to the um, AI assistant, that true co-pilot level is where I'm uh, excited for. I think we're going to get there kind of fast. I think it's, it's more about the trust and adoption piece. Technically it'll be feasible. What is the trust and adoption piece on, you know, on our end? I mean, I'm, I'm I'm gonna be maybe a little bit more idealistic and talk more about like when we start getting out of the level two and into the level three area. And when we, right now we're just, most of these solutions are making just healthcare less awkward and less wasteful and painful. I'm excited when we actually get to better. Um, what got me interested in generative AI in the first place was at uh, first hand the previous value-based care company that I was working for putting together and prototyping some solutions that would, when we were intaking these really complicated um, polymorbid uh, med psych patients, look through all their med lists and find problems and make recommendations. And we found enormous amounts of issues. Um, and this is the kind of thinking that if you had a good internist spending half an hour on every patient, they would find these things, but they're not, there's no good internist in spending a half an hour on med review on every complex Medicaid patient. And so like, there's a lot of adverse effects. There's a lot of ineffective prescribing. There's a lot of like quality, like the health care we deliver at scale in this country is not good. Um, and I look forward to when like we can start actually making the delivery quality better um, using the, the resources of the, of the artificial intelligence. Got it. Unfortunately, well, there's not really any money in it in the short term, so it's going to be a while. Still, an aspirational, aspirational way to end. Um, well, awesome. This was fantastic. Huge thank you to all three of you. I think this was a great panel. Um, and a huge thank you to our audience for, for joining. Uh, hopefully, you got some value out of it. Um, we'll, we'll leave it there. I hope everyone has a great rest of their Friday. Thanks so much.